the first child's burden, especially being the first child of a teen mother. Of a teen, <laughs> yes. Yes. You know? And then like, shout out to us. Yes. But also, too, I'm just so, um, my mom has grown so much. She, she has so much wisdom and power. Mm. And I'm just, I love her so much, yeah. you know? And it took so much work on both ends to get mm-hmm. to this point. Yeah. Um, and I accept her and I love her. Oh my God, I already? I thought, oh my God, Allie. there's tissues right here. Uh, but, you know, I accept her and I love her. And yes, she's yeah, the yeah. best thing that's ever happened to me. And, you know, it, yeah, it was, it was hard, you know, because I'm watching her. My brothers will never understand right. the experience, the experiences that I've, I've had with our mom, right? you know, and I've seen her grow up and sometimes if, you know, ha- that's mortifying. That's so embarrassing. It's, it's <laughs> a sure, lot. You know, if it's I was, a, if I was a teen mom and I had a child, I would, I don't know. I, I might've been worse, you know? Right. And so I, I, I think parents deserve a lot of grace because yeah. they're human too. And I'm very fortunate to have, Move past a lot of um, carrying of trauma or resentment yeah. towards my parents, and now I can see her for the woman, the the human, the strong woman that she is, and um, I'm just so grateful. I'm so I, happy. I want- What's going on? Welcome to Growing Up Latina. I am your host, Ali V. And I know I say this every episode that I'm super excited, but I am super excited. <laughs> I really am because this show, honestly, it it brings me joy to do this. And I was telling my guest, Brittany, okay, <laughs> Brittany Chavez, uh, CEO and founder of Shop Latinx. Um, but I was just talking to you offline and I was telling you like, this is a true passion project for me. And just telling our stories really like brings me a lot of joy, like genuinely, like this is what I love to do. And so I really feel a connection towards you. And I, I know, I know, I, <laughs> guys, I love tissues, by the way, because I'm like, it, it may get a little emotional today. Yeah. Um, and so I, in my journey of, you know, just trying to find small uh, Latin-owned businesses, um, I came across Jalisa Prado, Love CEO her. of Rizos Curls, mm-hmm. and I just Googled literally lat- small Latina-owned businesses, and Shop Latinx came up, and y- your Instagram was like the hub for all of this. And I'm like, well, this is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is amazing. Um, and then I kind of like, you know, you start digging a little deeper, a little deeper. And um, I love everything that you're doing for us, you know, um, in a time where I felt like, okay, this was kind of missing. You didn't see it. And honestly, like you were the only person that was in that lane. And I was like, wow, this is like, so brilliant that someone would even come up with this. And so I just felt connected and wanted to know everything about you, right? (laughs) Like I was like, I need to know her. Like I need to find out how she got started. And then I I went even a little deeper and I heard a little bit of the story. And I was telling you when I do these interviews, I don't like to do that much research because I feel like during the research process, when you just begin and begin and you just go deeper and deeper, it affects the interview. Um, and I want to be like my listeners. Like, I want to get to know you at the same time they get to know you. Um, So I actually stopped doing research on you just because (laughs) I really wanted to just get the organic feel. So thank you so much for coming on the show. This was like- I receive all of that. Thank you. With no hesitation, guys. Like, she literally, I reached out to her, like, I would love to interview you, and you immediately- I immediately responded. Yeah. Um. And it's an honor to be here. And I'm so excited. You're so right. Like offline, you and I were just 
talking as if we knew each other for years. Crazy. Um, so I'm really excited to see what's going to come to surface in this conversation between two phenomenal Latinas yes. that are doing the best we can, breaking barriers um, with love and community. And yeah. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we can start. Like, where do we start, right? Where do we start? There's where do so we much start? To talk about. Right. So, <laughs> I feel like I always want to start with like the upbringing. Okay. But through the upbringing, it could be triggering. That's what I find, at least. You know, I was telling you, I'm like, oh, my girls cry here. But we cry because when you start going into like the nitty gritty of like how someone grew up, it touches like, uncomfortable grounds right yeah it, it yes and it's so interesting too how you know I do a lot of podcasts and I do a lot of interviews and every interview I'm at a different stage of life and a different stage of processing a lot of my life mm -hmm. you know I did an interview I think like eight months ago where I was asked about my upbringing mm -hmm. and you know one mention of my dad it became instantly waterworks whereas now I might, th that's not to say that I'm not going to cry again, right. but I think now mm -hmm. I can look f at it from a, an outsider's perspective and be, and give so much grace to the people that raised me. Um, and just feeling a sense of, um, acceptance for the way that I was raised because, mm -hmm. you know, I look at my mother and she was, you know, a single mother who raised me and, you know, I think about her background and the women, um, you know, my grandmother, my great grandmother, you know, who all experienced some form of um, abuse or sadness. Mm -hmm. And then I look at my mom who genuinely tried her best yeah. to raise me. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um and that's mm -hmm. how my parents met. So my mom's Guatemalan and okay. my dad's Nicaraguense. Mm -hmm. They met in the same apartment complex. Nice. Um, and yeah, so even with my dad, um, he used to be in the picture. And then as I grew up, he was no longer in the picture. And he was dealing with his own um, issues and, and life took him somewhere else. And I can look back and be like, I love him so much and he's taught me so much. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of my upbringing, you know, is I, I think growing up, a lot of us in um, broken households, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's become the norm and, um, you know, it, it's it been intentionally created, mm -hmm. you know, by society to ensure that communities of color um, – their homes are broken up and divided and I'm so happy to like have made it through and yeah. made something of myself despite the odds mm -hmm. um, that are stacked against us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. How I'm just, many, how many people in the household, like when you grew up? So were you one of one? <clears throat> like how did that? I'm an only child. Well, I, I grew up an only child. Okay. Uh, my mom had me um, a month after her 17th birthday. So she okay. had just turned 18 a month after her 18th birthday. She had okay. just turned 18. Mm -hmm. And um, later on, I actually have two brothers. She remarried. I have an 11-year-old brother and an 8-year-old brother. But okay. growing up, I was an only child. So I was an only child living with my mom, who was also a baby. I couldn't right. even imagine being 17 years old and right. pregnant. That wasn't that so was we never have similar a thing. stories. Really? Not, not with me. but So my mom got married when she was 14. What? And had, yes, my mom was 14 when she got married. And then she had her first child, which is my older sister, at 17. My mom had wow. me when she was 24. Wow. And that's interesting, right? Like, even now that they're both older, it's literally like sometimes they argue sometimes. And I'm like, guys, what's happening here? But it's because there's, you know, they're kind of like both learning each other. Still going through that divorce. She was the oldest one of us going through that divorce. I was young when my mom and my dad got divorced. So imagine. So when I hear your story, I'm like, 
Okay. The first child's burden, especially being the first child of a teen mother. Of a teen, yes. <laughs> yes. You know? And then like, there, shout out to us. Yes. But also, too, I'm just so, um, my mom has grown so much. She, she has so much wisdom and power. Mm. And I'm just, I love her so much, yeah. you know? And it took so much work on both ends to get mm-hmm. to this point. Yeah. Um, and I accept her and I love her. Oh my God, I already? I said, oh my God, Allie. there's tissues right here. But, you know, I accept her and I love her. And yes, she's yeah, the yeah. best thing that has ever happened to me. And, you know, it, yeah, it was, it was hard, you know, because I'm watching her. My brothers will never understand right. the experience, the experiences that I've, I've had with our mom, right? you know, and I've seen her grow up and sometimes if, you know, ha- that's mortifying. That's so embarrassing. It's, it's <laughs> a sure, lot. You know, if it's I was, a, a if I was a teen mom and I had a child, I would, I don't know. I, I might've been worse, you know? Right. And so I, I, I think parents deserve a lot of grace because yeah. they're human too. And I'm very fortunate to have, Move past a lot of um, carrying of trauma or resentment yeah. towards my parents, and now I can see her for the woman, the the human, the strong woman that she is, and um, I'm just so grateful. I'm so I, happy. I want to touch on that. Oh, I first of all, I love you. <laughs> I can love I you? Just, I love you. <laughs> um, yeah. There's so many things I want to unpack in this moment. Um, uh-huh. First, I feel like there's a lot of relatability here. Um, I think growing up for me, I was so angry at my mom for a long time. I was so angry because, well, for one, I didn't understand what was going on. Um, And my mom did an excellent job with like holding everything down and making everything Mm -hmm. seem perfect outside. Yeah. When inside it was all kind of crumbling down, right? but it wasn't until I got older and I went into therapy that my therapist said, because I remember there was a session where I was like, oh, I'm so angry at her. Like, you know, like a lot of the reasons why I am the way that I am is because of her. And she gave me a different perspective. Mm. And she said, no, I think your mom is like strong. Like, I think, like, I admire your mother. Wow. If anything, like, she really like, look how great you turned out. And I never got that perspective because I was targeting her like, you know, and then when you when you become older, you start to see some sort of sim, sim, similarities of your mom. I am just like my mother. And you're like, oh, I don't want to be like her. You know, like, that's how I was. Like, I, I kept telling my therapist, like, I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be like her. And she's like, no, I think your mom is like actually like a superwoman. And wow. when I got that perspective, it shifted everything for me. Um, and so I think my next question is, what do you admire the most about your mom? Her softness. Mm. And I think it's also a trait that's new to her as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because for so long, especially growing up, she had to be like in her masculine, you know? And she had to figure out how to pay for the bills, how to provide. Um, She had to navigate, you know, being a mother and being just a woman without Mm -hmm. a lot of um, teachers or people to show her love. Right. Ooh. Ooh, Okay. No, listen, Uh, I... And and now... um, So I have a brother. He um, is diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes. Mm. And... um, Yeah, that's hard. You know, the way yeah. that she just shows up for her children, mm-hmm. even for me. She will always make time for me. I talk to her every day and, you know, I'll vent to her and she'll she's there to listen and provide so much wisdom and yeah. softness. And um, my brother is having a hard time. She, she shows up for him. And, you know, I, I wanted to say at first, like, strength, but I, I love this – season that she gets to be soft and like 
you know, she just bought, uh, she's going to the Beyonce concert with her friends, yes. you know, <laughs> and yes. she's just doing things that you could just tell, like, she, she loves her life. Yeah. And I admire that. She, she, she just loves the little things where I think sometimes I, I, I never really give myself the grace to stop and smell the flowers mm -hmm. or to stop and look back and see how hard I've how far I've come. Yeah. Because I'm always worried about like the next thing, yeah. you know, or like, okay, fine. I raised a million, but like now I need to raise five. You know right. what I mean? Like I have X brands in shop at next. I need this many, you know, like it's never enough. And I put myself in this perpetual cycle of like just being down on myself and not seeing like the bright side of things. And right. my mom I think her softness and her ability to be like, I love my home. I love my family. Yeah, we may not have much to to what other people think, but this is, I'm so rich in love yeah. and family. And my mom used to say, like, all I wanted was a dishwasher and a washer and dryer. And I have a home. I have a pool. I have ch two children that, like, love right. me. And so I think... I feel like perspective, mm -hmm. her softness and her perspective on what matters. Right. Well, if she showed up for you and your brother, who showed up for her? Who was like her shoulder to lean on? Maybe her husband. Okay. My stepdad. Okay. He's amazing. Yeah? Yeah. And. Well, when did your dad leave? Um. Because you guys now, I just, I, I want to paint the picture for everyone. Yeah. You're in L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was born and raised, yeah. Yeah, you were born and raised in L.A. Um, your mom and your dad were at the time together, right? So you grew up with your mom <clears throat> and your dad. Uh, It was on and off. It was on and off. Yeah. Okay. And then he left when I was around um, 15. 15. And I think that's such like a pivotal. Super. You know, it's like, how do I go from, and there were signs. So he, he. I, I mean, did him. he have a conversation with you? Like, um, hey, I'm going to leave. Or did he just like up and leave? Um, well, he was on drugs. And I think over time I started to notice, mm -hmm. you know, I was put in some unsafe situations or mm -hmm. his demeanor and his characteristics shifted or, you know, he was fairly pleasant to be around. And now he was just like sleeping all day. And I didn't understand why. Okay. So, so there yeah. was never a serious conversation had between you and your dad. No. Where you, okay. No. <laughs> yeah. No, it just kind of like, kind of fizzled. Okay. Um, I remember the last time, one of the last time, like last time that I saw him when I was 15 and there was like a gap period. I heard someone come up the stairs in our apartment complex mm -hmm. and um, I heard like a knock on the door. Mm-hmm. And then he, like, ran out. And I opened it, and it was a red bandana and, like, Tupac's greatest hit CD. Mm. <laughs> it was so random. Yeah. And then I, like, run downstairs. I'm like, Dad. And he's like, uh, uh, I got to go. You know, he was he was on one. Yeah. Respectfully. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love him, though. Right. And, yeah, like, I hope he's doing well. You know, I hope yeah. that – whether it's in this lifetime or next lifetime. Like, mm -hmm. I hope that he, I hope that all of us break out of karmic cycles right. and get to a place where we can live our best lives and really uplift consciousness. You know, I right. hate that people are in pain or feel the need to, like, you know, self-harm or, or yeah. leave. Um, and I, I wish, you know... I just want love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I you just know, want if, love. When Well, was he always on drugs during your upbringing? Were, were there happy um, moments with your dad? There were was amazingly he... happy moments. Okay. And I think that's why I held on. Okay. You know, there were so many great moments. And it wasn't until I was older that I started to see because just like your mom, my mom would, um, you know, like – she she would make sure that I didn't see any of that, okay. you know, and despite whatever they went through, I always had my dad. Right. Um so 
yeah, I wasn't, I didn't really know until I was older, Mm -hmm. but he was amazing when I was growing up. Like, what were some of the things that you Um, found amazing in your dad? Like, I think what type of dad was he like? He was in terms goofy. Of, he was goofy. Was he, he was, like the we athletic had, dad? Like, would you guys play ball or something? Or he was like random. Like he would take me. <laughs> like we would have. Yeah. Like we would go to Venice Beach, nice. and we would have a day of like swimming in the ocean. And I would be on his back, and he would just like jump under waves. Yeah, and then we'd lay out, and he put like a cap on his head, and we would just both lay out and tan. Um. And then he was also a photographer, and so he took so many pictures of me. And at first, you know how annoying it is when parents want to take, like, pictures of you. Yeah. You're like, Dad, stop. But now I look back, and I'm like, I have a whole album of so many cute photos of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, He would cook for me. He would play. I remember, like, us, you know, he was playing Thriller on – he got the record, yeah, and he was teaching me how to like moonwalk, and it was just so goofy <laughs> and loving yeah. and like adventurous. And he didn't, he wasn't a big fan of like buying me things. Mm-hmm. It was like experiences, you know what I mm-hmm. mean? Like he'd drive me to like a cemetery, and we'd like just walk, and he'd create a story or a line around it. He was yeah. just very creative, um, very musical, very adventurous. He didn't have much, Mm -hmm. but I think I also got resourcefulness from him and my mom, you -hmm. know, where he would make me, if we had, like, nothing to eat, (laughs) he'd get a can of tuna and, like, some top ramen and, like, make a meal. And it tasted good the way that he seasoned it, you know, so. uh, I know. (laughs) I know. I know. I, you know, I I was telling you before when we spoke, I said dads play such a huge part, right? in our lives because that's how it shows up when you become an adult. Yeah. Um, you know, I was angry at my dad. Like I was so angry and I didn't understand why. And I just remember like my dad's Dominican and so and he only speaks Spanish. Oh really? Yeah. So when I moved to New York, I lost all of my Spanish eventually. Um, and so I would have the most difficult time communicating with him, but I wanted answers, right? Mm. Naturally, right? I'm like, why'd you do this to my mom? And and like interrogating him, yeah. not understanding nor realizing what happened between his parents and him. Like, what was that like, you know? And so I wonder, like, what what are your relationships with like your great grandparents, your grandparents? And yeah. what is that like? So... And were they around? Do you know them? Or did you have an opportunity to even catch up, speak to them at any time? Yeah, I am. So growing up, my mom and my grandmother raised me um, okay. for the most part. And I can totally see why my parents, you know, grew up the way that they did mm-hmm. and felt the way that they did. Um, my dad was oftentimes, yeah, like neglected um, and... Yeah, but my, my grandma was really loving to me. Yeah. Um, and that's it. You know, my mom's dad passed when he was eight. Mm. Um, and then my grandparents on my dad's side, yeah, I can totally see. Um, yeah, you see it. His dad disowned him. Um, and, yeah, I feel like he just never felt enough. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and when things got too heavy for him, he, instead of facing it or taking accountability, he turned to other things. Yeah. Um, and so as I got older, I can totally see now and I feel, you know, a sense of sadness, but yeah. also gratitude because it's not like they want, he wanted to leave. Mm-hmm. It's not like he, it wasn't out of malice. All right. You know, it's, he just did it because he felt the need to like protect himself. Mm-hmm. Do you have a relationship with him now? No, no. but it's okay. okay. I feel like I've come to peace with it. And what I'm realizing is, you know, none of us, this is like our first, like navigating and being my thirties. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what, what will come of him and I 10 years from now. You know, I may be open to it then mm-hmm. just because I cut someone off now or because this person isn't in my life Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that down the line, you know, 
things yeah. can't change. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. I may be open to it. However, I have bigger things to focus on. Yes. I have so much love in my life. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful. And it took a lot to get here, you know, and there's things in relationships that need to be put on pause mm-hmm. so that I can get to a place in that's aligned with my greatest destiny, you know, and mm. these are the people that in their own way, granted it was hard for me at times, have helped facilitate that. And I don't really need that energy right now. <laughs> I need to, I need to focus on myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, like growing up, I remember my sister, um, my older sister who made a lot of sacrifices. Yeah. For my family. Uh-huh. Um, and when I came in the picture, as I got older, went to high school, um, I don't want to use the word selfish, but I, I, I would say I understood the meaning of self-love at a very early age and putting myself first mm-hmm. in situations. Um, and my sister, she would get so angry at me. And she would say, I made these sacrifices. And and I'm like, I hear you, but there's just certain sacrifices that I'm not willing to make if it causes me my mental health, you know? And that was like a big battle for my family. Um, and so That's I'm, a beautiful realization that you had. Yeah, you know? it, but it's hard, right? Because now in my 30s, it, the language is self-love, self-care, right? right. But... <clears throat> When I was 15, 14, it was, you're being selfish, right? So it was a very hard time going through it. Wow. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not an only child. I have five sisters, four brothers, yeah. you know? Wow. Yeah. So I'm like, I know all about sharing and now I don't want to share anymore. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to do that. I want to focus on myself, my business. I want, you know, everyone has had a chance to live their life, my mom, my dad. Now I just want to focus on what I want to say to the world. You know, I, I want to talk about what it was like um, growing up Latina in L.A. What was that like? It was fine. Yeah. I think um, being a Central American, mm-hmm. it, it was a little difficult um, navigating um, a Latino space that was predominantly Mexican. Mm-hmm. Um, so I found that to be a little bit difficult growing up. But also, too, like, I wasn't really surrounded by a lot of Latinos. Mm. Um, I went to, like, a predominantly white school. Okay. Um, and I was in musical theater, and most of my friends were white and black, and then I was Latina. Um, and I feel like there are so many parts of me that assimilated to whiteness and wanting to be white. And all the play dates I went on were like white families, um, where we had white kids with right. you know in a two parent household in a huge house in the valley, um, mm-hmm. in the hills, and um. Yeah, I had a sense of shame, you know, because mm. then my grandma at the time would pick me up from school and like her her old brown Honda mm. Accord with the rosary and, you know, I just like run in and go like that, yeah. you know, and looking back, I'm like, damn, I wish I had more pride, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was my upbringing. I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. I, I can understand a little bit yeah. and I can get by and mm-hmm. like... Um, when I go visit Guatemala. Mm -hmm. However, that's also something that I think this year I really want to challenge myself to to learn is Spanish. Um, But it was also interesting because, yeah, I grew up and um, I used to get made fun of for, like, being white or, like, acting white or just the way that I spoke. Mm -hmm. And I was also musical theater. And so... um, So you were into the arts and... I was into the arts, yeah. So I loved acting. I loved to do all of that. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I would go home and... Is that what you wanted to be when you, like... Yes. You said you wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be an actress and then I wanted to be like Oprah. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, every day after school, I'd go home and watch Oprah. My grandma would make me beans and rice. And my grandma would make a lot of traditional food. Mm -hmm. And she would listen to a lot of beautiful Spanish songs. So it was my connection to her... That made me, that gave me a sense of, 
okay, I'm Latina. Right, you know, right. it was the food. It was the chile rellenos. It was, you know, just who she was. And um, because of her, I did feel a small sense of pride. Right. Um, but it didn't, that pride didn't really erupt until a few years ago when I started Shop Latinx. Yeah, well, that was going to be my next question yeah. because if you felt like a little disconnected and you went to a predominantly white school, you didn't speak the language, how then, and and take us through the journey of like, now you start this company, Shop Latinx, where now you really are putting the pride in the <laughs> forefront, right? And you're like, Crazy, no, right? we're here. We <laughs> yeah. are here. Like, how does that work? And what what is that journey like? Oh, my God. This journey is beautiful. Yeah. But with beautiful also comes beautiful is perspective, right. you know? Um, but with it comes a lot of inner work, complexities, a lot to there's so much to grasp and understand, especially when um you're trying to build a business in an industry that you're not really familiar with. Yeah. Um yeah. And Shop Latinx in 2016, it started off as an Instagram account. So, you know, I think I can't do the math, but the first few years, three to four years, it was just me. I was a nanny. I was an intern. I was an Uber driver. I worked at a weed shop. All at the I same was time. still, yeah, I was oh like, just, I was a hustler in LA. Yeah. You know, I rented out a room and a house in Burbank, California. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just trying to figure it out. But I saw this void where you know i saw a lot of latina latinx owned brands and companies and stories you know and i'm like well where's the place that's like highlighting all of this well let me create it and at the time too like i was on the search for community um Mm. and trying to find people that i can identify with women who similar to me are second generation Mm -hmm. you know very integrated in mm-hmm. you know yeah. in society and like you know we're, we're we're navigating the complexities of like identity and language and culture yeah and you know shop latinx was a community that was created for people and people like myself to feel seen you know and for stories to be told and for their products to be highlighted right um and then through that i noticed bigger um, opportunities, you know, it's, I've got, I got several dozen DMs of people saying like, you posted this product, like, where can I go buy it? Oh. Like, oh, you go on their website, you know, or you, you, you have to go there. And I was kind of like this directory. And then I was right. also direct. Yeah. I was directing people to go shop, but then I was like, well, there's such an opportunity. Like, what if I created a company that showcased the best, you know, Latin made products made by our people and we share their stories, you know, I'm like, I need to figure out how to do this. And I learned about the world of venture capital. Mind you, again, there was a period where I had a Prius and that's Mm -hmm. what I would use to Uber drive. Mm -hmm. Um, I got it totaled and I had no source of income Uh and I had to move back to my parents' house in Pomona, California. Mm-hmm. And by then my, you know, my I have two little brothers and there's a toy room. And I'm like, sorry kids, I gotta take over the toy room. Oh my God. So I buy a twin bed and I put it on the floor uh-huh. and I turn, you know, I move this, I bring out the old desks that I used to have uh-huh. from the garage into the room and I'm just click clacking, figuring out what VC is, you know, all these things, um, learning about it. And I'm like, yo, there's so much money out there. And I'm like, I see it there. You know, I'm targeting the fastest growing demographic. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm building this amazing community. Mm-hmm. All I need to do is like figure out this business model. And I think I have something. So I, I enrolled in accelerator programs to learn more about business. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, long story short, it was a wild two years, especially during the pandemic. And I ended up on the other side raising a million dollars. Insane. Freaking crazy. So wait, hold on. <laughs> like, but, I mean, I have, there's so much I'm there. Like, you missed the whole it's a, yeah. gap. So, because here's, there's so many things here. There's so many things. It doesn't sound, from what I'm hearing, that anyone in your family did anything like this. No. So where did you see this? Where, ha- what, what entrepreneur um, did you see in your life that Oprah. you- Oprah. 
it was Oprah. <laughs> I, I shit you not. Yeah, I hear you. Like, actually. That's a good one to like, model, <laughs> not gonna lie. So, okay. So now, did you go to college? I did, and then I got kicked out for okay. having a low GPA. Okay. So I went to Cal Poly Pomona. Um, my major was communication with an emphasis in journalism. So again, it was women like Oprah and Lisa Ling that really inspired me you know mm -hmm. the fact that like oprah built a show and in a whole empire based around the human connection right. by bringing people onto their show just like you're doing yeah. to interview them and to tell stories and to give people a platform to share authentically right. and i was always gravitated to that i mean even look back at like me wanting to be an actress, you know, it's like human connection so right. i was my whole life craving human connection and you know, even taking that a step back and thinking about like my upbringing and, you know, feeling isolated as an only child and not in feeling that no one can hear me, you know, mm -hmm. everything happens for a reason. Because if I didn't feel like that, would I be searching for human connection? Right. <laughs> you right, know, right. and if I grew up around kids that looked like me, would I be the best fit to create Shop Latin next? Because mm. I wouldn't think that would be needed because I have all my people and I know all the spots already, right. you know? So I think that like everything is is designed with intention. Right. Even the parents that you're, you've been chosen, that you chose that you to chose. have, yeah. Yeah. you know? And, you know, it, it all played a role into the manifestation of Shop Latin next. And I just wanted to feel like I belonged. You know, right. sometimes it was to my own detriment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I felt I held on and cared a little bit too much about what other people thought of me. Mm. And that's something that I'm moving through right now. But, but there was a change. At some point in your mind, you said something needs to change. Something needs you to change. And then also, too, I, you know, at an early age, I realized that, like, no one's going to advocate for me the way that I'm going to advocate for myself. But then also, like, you didn't have, you had the education because you you were looking up to an Oprah. So you, and, and it sounded like you did a lot of research, right? Um, what was the transition from making this into an Instagram page to now running this as a business? Well, <clears throat> I was really poor. I was really broke. <laughs> it's a lot of our stories. <laughs> I was okay. really broke. And it was like, am I going to bet on myself and figure it out with this thing that is growing? And I see the potential. Like, I see it. You know, we have $1.9 trillion in annual spending power. We're the fastest, youngest gr growing demographic in the United States. You know what I mean? You can't tell me. And if I'm able to target this consumer and talk to her authentically, I have something here. I, I It has to work, you know? And so, and if it doesn't, what am I going to do? I have nothing on my resume. Am I going to apply to be a social media associate, you know? And, and at the time, like, I had bills to pay. And I, I was like, let me just take the leap. You know, I've I've been an intern. I've been a nanny. You know, I, I see the, the glass ceiling, you know, and I see who's in charge of handing out the checks. Right, right. And they don't look like me, you know, and I'm going to go bet on myself now. Mm. And it brought me here. And in this lifetime, I have chosen to learn my greatest lessons through my company. Ooh. And so beautiful. It's, I could cry right now. Like, I, I could cry. Um, it's a journey. And I, I'm so grateful that I've been chosen to take this on, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm grateful that people can resonate with my story mm -hmm. and my upbringing and my, my, the company and the stories that we tell and the brands that we, that we partner with, um, in the products that they sell and mm -hmm. the ingredients that are in the products, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm still learning retail. Um, and, Last year was definitely a year of learning for myself personally through mm -hmm. therapy. I had I actually went from living in LA to then on a whim moving to Portland, Oregon for a year. Really? And a half. Yeah. What made you move over there? 
I needed to go heal. Okay. Yeah. What were you healing from? Like, what was, or what were um, you trying to heal from? Yeah, I think I needed to heal from everything. Okay. My my parent wounds, my, um, you know, self-doubt, um, relationships that no longer served me. I just needed to get away. And I think in LA, we're not, there's not a lot of nature. Right. But in Portland, there was so much forestry and nature. And like, I became one of those like tree huggers that would yeah. like, after work, I'd go into the forest, I'd lay there, I'd ground myself and I'd like go hug trees. I got therapy uh, twice a week. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of healing ceremonies. And yeah, it's been like- What's a healing ceremony? Like, what does that consist of? I mean, it can consist of so many things. Mm -hmm. um, it can be like energy healing, like a like similar to like Reiki yeah, in a way. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then um I also dabble with like mushrooms, um, bufo, yeah. which is like similar to There's something else that I heard that Will Smith did. What is that called? DMT? No, it was something that he said it was like the worst part. It's like going to the worst part of your life, head on, facing it head on. Oh my God, what is the word? It's like a it's like a, a liquid that you take. Oh my god. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> Your sister is over there like ayahuasca. ayahuasca. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what do, are you familiar with this? Or? I'm familiar with it. I've actually never done that before. Is this something you would I feel like I want to do it. I'm not going to lie, but then I'm honestly, like, why would I want to go to the worst part of my life? <laughs> I'm done. I feel yeah, like you're, okay. You're healed. You're I, I'm not healed. Okay, you're not healed. I'm not healed, but I think I'm done throwing myself into situation like i need to take better care of myself i feel like last year i was like let's do it let's go like yeah. hit me like punch me in the face like show me yeah. you know what i mean and now i just want to like ease into things mm. you know like we don't need to attack things like head on if we don't right. you know you can but also too it's like even right now with the ceremony i just did there's so much that I'm moving through mm -hmm. and so much that I'm navigating and so many feels and right. I don't know where to place them and I'm overwhelmed and it's like showing up. Like it's literally like I developed a cough that's mm -hmm. literally has to do with like my throat chakra. So I'm like mm. detoxing, okay. you know, but sometimes when you do ayahuasca or when you do things, make sure it's not willy nilly because there's a lot of post care that, mm -hmm. that's, that, that needs to happen. You right. know, so when you do ayahuasca, you need to make sure that you have like six healing sessions lined up because your body's not going to know what to do with the trauma that they had locked away over here yeah. for 20 years. And, you know, it was, you know, it was showing up as a an ache or a pain, but right. now it's, it's all these feelings and you don't know what to do and you can drive yourself crazy. Right. And that's the last thing you want because yeah, you came there absolutely. to heal, Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. so... I think with medicine, it's so mm -hmm. sacred, mm -hmm. um, and obviously it's ancestral, and it's it's tied to to people like you and me, right. you know, and our ancestors. This is something that they that they medicine that they used to do. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think just in order to protect ourselves and to not, you know, we we need to use it wisely, absolutely, um, and 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 find people and that. Uh, and teachers that know how to s distribute the medicine respectfully because mm -hmm. that's another thing is like the whitewashing of these industries. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think now I'm just, you know, going to reduce my medicine ceremonies to once a year um, on my birthday weekend. But mm -hmm. then throughout the year, it's just going to be um, energy, healings, limpias, all that. What and was yoga. your... In respects to Oprah, what was your <laughs> aha moment? Ooh. I feel like I've had so many. And they, they sometimes they show up like that in your life, it's throughout your life. What was like your top two moments where you felt like that shift, that change, that now you're on the other side of it? One recent was my freaking boyfriend. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think even me moving out to New York, uh, you know, so prior to this, prior to us recording, we we're talking about love and yeah. talking about how for me, I would try to, you know, all my partners in the past had some sort of resemblance to um, my father, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't yeah. until I cleared that and I put so much work into healing that wound um, and healing my womb mm-hmm. that I came out onto the other side and I had attracted someone who has actually been here this whole time, yeah. but I didn't really see him or see him as my partner because I wasn't healed. Um, and when I healed that wound, you know, to, to the outsiders, it may seem that it, it happened really quickly, mm-hmm. but I knew that like he was the one for me. Yeah. And had I still been blindsided by how I used to perceive love, which was like, if they weren't giving me anxiety, then like, it's not love. Or if mm. like, they weren't being trifling, then it's not, <laughs> it's well, not love. What is, what is your love language? Um, someone asked me this the other day and I said, my love language, I don't know. It was a, it was a prompt that said like, what does, what does your love sound like? Oh, that's a good and one. And it, I said, it sounds like eggs cracking on the pan mm-hmm. and like wa- like coffee being poured into a mug. And then like my partner saying like, here, honey, breakfast is ready. Yes. You know, I think that love to me is thoughtfulness. Mm-hmm. It's kindness. It's adoration. Mm-hmm. It's uplifting. It's genuine. It's heartfelt. It's soft. You know, I feel like I don't want to be, I don't want to be an an independent bad bitch anymore. (laughs) I'm tired. I've said that so many times. People tell me you're independent. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys. I don't want to be independent. Oh my God. Um, How important is it to heal yourself before you can find love in a partner i think i think you can still actively heal while you're in partnership okay but also too i'll speak from my experience is i had to heal myself to get to a point where i can attract a love that can show up for me while i still heal Mm. you know what i mean that's deep that was deep was it? Yeah, that was deep. That was deep. You give me hope. You know, <laughs> you it's like you don't for... have to be fully healed. No one's ever fully healed. You know, like this yeah. human experience is fucking hard, man. It's so hard. We don't know what we're doing. It's we're not so given hard. the blueprint. And what's crazy is we've probably done this thousands of times before, but we forgot. And yeah. now we're here trying to figure it out. And not just figure it out, but like figure it out, figure out how to navigate life while trying to do things that we love, passion projects, navigate capitalism. Well, that's the other thing, right? Like now, all right, so you found <clears throat> love, but even before you found the love, there was the love of your business and how to navigate through that and teaching yourself that, like who were some of the people that you looked up to or not even looked up to, but um, can rely on for advice in terms of business and how to really grow this company in a way where, like you said, you were broke, right? You didn't have the money. (laughs) So passion project or not, at some point, even in your passion project, you're like, how does this equate to dollars for me? Because at some point you're like, "Uh, should I go back to work? Like, What do I do? So talk about that moment. And I what, mean, was, what was your last job before you actually launched into a business and made this like a real thing where it's like, I'm going to go full I force with this. I was an A&R intern at Interscope. An intern. I was like the one that like was given the mundane tasks, was like told to like ship out something, to told, you know, uh, email someone that won concert tickets. Like yeah. it was just desk work, you know, mm-hmm. no shade. You know, I no, 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 I get it. Um, yeah. 
so yeah, I didn't have a business background. Like I, I was never, but what I think is, I feel like a lot of us have business backgrounds, especially as Latinos, mm-hmm. but we're not given the opportunity, mm. you know, like seeing the way, you know, street vendors or, you know, like we grow up when you grew up working class, like those are the hustlers, you yeah. know, the ones that wake up at 6 a.m. You know, my mom used to wake up at 4 a.m., put on her suit. You know, she worked at Coca-Cola as a exec assistant to, like, some guy. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, she'd take the train. She'd make sure she dropped me off. Like, she would get shit done. Yeah. You know what I mean? My yeah. grandma was um, a house cleaner at Kaiser, you know, working, I think, graveyard or maybe early morning. But she was up, you know, right. and then she made so home. So you were she surrounded got by these Yeah, customers. so, yeah. like. So it was in your blood already. It was there. Maybe I'm... S- Maybe in in this real moment right now, I'm now seeing it that way because mm-hmm. I think before I used to be like, "How the fuck did I get here?" Yeah, I had, yeah. I I I would say that I had no mentors, no teachers, but I think now looking back, they were like, right in front. They of were face. right, in- just like the love <gasps> of your life, just like the love of your life. It was they right were right here in this front whole of your time. Face. Huh. Yeah. And it's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> that literally just gave me goosebumps. You know, it's, that just gave me goosebumps. But, and I also think too, again, it's like, I realized that like, no one's going to push for me. I remember like something dumb. Like I needed a car to go take a driver's test. Mm-hmm. And my mom wasn't going to give me the car. So I had to go, like, figure it out. Mm-hmm. And so I eventually had my friend give me the car. But I remember, like, I would take – like, I did have a car, and I ha- I'd have to take the bus everywhere, you know, like, just to – you know. And and I, I remember that was a big lesson, like, oh, no one's going to do it for me. Mm-hmm. Like, I have to go do it. That's right. But in terms of raising venture capital, yeah, like, I don't Where even... did you learn that? I'm fascinated by this, by the way, because I feel like – like even in with you know I, I have two companies now and the I guess the topic has always been like investors partnerships and those things that's where it gets tricky right because Ugh. you it's like you have a dream and you plan up to that moment but then you don't know what happens after that moment you don't like I can only tell it's you like you venture into the unknown you venture into I'm, the unknown I have ventured into the unknown um how big is your team? Let's start there. Five. Five. And did they find you? Did you find them? Like, how did that work? So, for example, so this is crazy. Um, so my head of retail and merchandising, who I just brought on this month, was the former vice president of merchandising um, for Barney's New York. Mm. And she's incredible. She was there for, I think, over a decade. Okay. Um, and she had focused on men's merchandising. So she facilitated the partnership between like Virgil and Off-White with Barney's and then Jerry Lorenzo with Fear of God at mm. Barney's. She mm-hmm. is incredible. She's Puerto Rican. She lives in Dumbo. Love it. And um, I had did an interview with this other podcast called Claim of Stories. Mm-hmm. And on that one, I was crying, oh. sobbing, but telling yeah. him about my story. And she had reached out to me on LinkedIn, Wanda, mm-hmm. telling me how she listened to my episode. And... um wanted to just connect on LinkedIn. When I saw her, I immediately knew she's the one. It mm. was so weird. And sometimes that's bit me in the ass. Right. Okay. Because I see someone and I see, and I, I I run to them and I ignore all red flags, but mm-hmm. with her, I was like she's the one that's going to help me take Shopbot next to the next level because I've come to a point where I acquired the million dollars. Mm -hmm. I have relationships with so many brands, but this is really tricky because what I'm trying to do is very logistical and requires, you know, it's not like a, 
like an e-commerce brand, which is very hard in its own right. Mm -hmm. However, I'm creating the platform. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I want to be the next Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. I want to be the next Goop, you know, and I don't know what I'm doing, period. I think founders need to be more honest, Yes, (laughs) you know, and I reached out to her. I met her in December, you know, and and then she she came around back in January and now we're working together and mm. she's killing it. And the future of Shop Latin Next is looking so bright mm. and it's looking exactly how I how I envisioned it years ago and I yeah. didn't know how I was gonna get there. And so the people on my team, I mean, I have another amazing woman. She's my chief of staff. Her name is Myra. Mm-hmm. I met her when I was living in Portland. And um she was just very persistent and um, reached out to me, asked for a job. She attended an event that I had. And then weeks later, um, we met and I hired her and she's been my by my side ever since. But I will also say that like hiring is really tricky too, you know, Super. especially when I've never been a boss. I've never been a manager. I don't know what traits to look out for. Right. Um Especially, and I can totally see how sometimes, like, people want to hire their friends or hire someone and um, junior so that they can give someone, like, an opportunity to be a mentor, you know, to and it's an opportunity for them to mentor when it's like, right. do you need to mentor or do you need experts? Right. Um, so that's been an incredible lesson that I'm, like, so mm. grateful for. And then also, too... Um, you know, with my therapy and with my healing, um, so many of the people that come to your life, into your life, the people that you work with, you know, a lot of them until you are he- until you're healed will be reflections of you and show you parts of yourself that you need to work on. Mm. You know, that's what we're all here for. Yeah. Everything is a projection, you know, and um, I'm so grateful for my team. It feels really good. Yeah. Um, and even with the model, right? We last year was a year of learning what's not working. And I think that's something that we take for granted. It's mm-hmm. like when we fail or when something's not working, we get down on ourselves, but it's actually yeah. a beautiful r- realization, you know? Yeah. And it's, I think the trick to business is learning what doesn't work quickly and adapting. And pivoting. Yeah. I think that's like my downfall because sometimes I'm too hard on myself, right? To the point where it's like I stay stuck in that feeling. And it's Mm. like I can't move forward. And my team is like, all right, Allie, this, it's past. Like, let's move past it. And I'm like, no, but we got to do better. We can't. No, it could be a little mistake. And no one's going to see it. Right. It's literally you. No one sees it and it's me. And I'm just like, no, we got to do better. Like, you don't understand. And it's it's not like I'm in competition with anyone. It's literally me versus <laughs> me and my dreams. Like, just where I want to be. So, like, little mistakes will really, like, get under my skin and I'll stay there for, like, days, weeks, months. And my team is like, all right, Ali, like, let's move past that. Um, I want to talk about the journey of making your first million. They always say your first million is like the hardest one to make, right? And what was your relationship with money? Because that plays a huge... Did you want... Like, was that a... Yes. No, that's a huge part of our upbringing. Like, your relationship with money growing... And my relationship sucked. My relationship (laughs) with money was so piss poor. And I really showed myself... I really showed my ass when that money was deposited. Mm -hmm. And the day that I announced the million dollar raise, I had a panic attack. Like, I felt like I wanted to die. Really? Because I felt the weight on my shoulders, this pressure to perform, this pressure to show up for my community. I just I just felt like I was taking on this huge responsibility and the light's shining on me and I yeah. don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, like, I felt like, like I swindled the money or something. Mm. It felt weird. It felt like, you know... It was hard. And 
it exposed me to a lot of financial trauma that I had. Mm. I didn't even, you know, like, it's so crazy. Like, VC is actually fucking nuts because Mm -hmm. I proposed this idea, you know, and they believed in me. So, so much of, you know, investing in an early stage company, it's like, okay, you see the problem, the solution, you see the traction so far, you see the opportunity, the market opportunity, how big this market is. Mm -hmm. They're like, wow, no one's doing this. Brittany, you seem passionate you seem whatever we're gonna give you this money um and go go get bring me back my returns turn this into a billion dollar company yeah mind you i was an intern oh my god oh my god (laughs) you know what i mean and now you know i'm doing my best getting into these programs and learning on the fly but it's basically like you know i say you know, there's kids that get the opportunity to go to Harvard Business School and sit in a classroom and do a project and stuff. I'm given a million dollars to go, you know, where, whereas I'm learning the business by running a business. On the uh, job. On the job. Yeah, on the job. And there's so many things that, you know, payroll, HR, you know, uh, business, the business model, the taxes, you know, everything. taxes, compliance, yeah. the product, the platform, email marketing, text, blah, 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 blah merchandise. <laughs> like, there's so many things on top of, you know, and then these investors want investor updates and the P&L, the financial yeah. model, the, the margins, you know, and I'm learning all of this. On I feel like I'm just like being dumped with like a whole stack of textbooks. Yeah. You know, it's real. It's, <laughs> it's real. so real. It's and so real. Sometimes, you know, I, I'm like, like, what was your biggest takeaway during that time? Because you couldn't give up. Like I you were up. too far. I'm never gonna give no, up. No, you couldn't give like, up. Like I will couldn't never actually will not. Was that even like an option for you? Was there no. was there ever a time where you said I Yes. There was. Yeah. Really? When was yeah. that? Uh last year I had to take several months to rebuild my relationship with Shop Latinx. Mm. And it had nothing to do with her. It was all me. And the fact that like I didn't place boundaries on myself. I grew resentful because I didn't know what I was doing. And I was like taking it out on this entity that I had created, Mm -hmm. but it really had to do with me. So building a company while being brown and working on my traumas in tandem, you know, that was all of last year. Um, And I'm still moving. But not to take it down. So would it be to like, restart something else no i wanted to take it down you want i was so over it but i think deep down i wasn't because a question that my therapist said was like okay so you're you you're so over it okay so if she was like if i was google and i offered you three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to shut down shop next and go work for me would you do it and i was like fuck no (laughs) and you know and i think it was just maybe me I don't know, just... Maybe you needed a break. I needed a break. And that's real. And that's real. But now it feels good. Yeah. I feel rejuvenated. I got a celebrity investment and what? I can't share it, but I would I love to update that gonna you. I going to be my next question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so last week was such, so, was a, such a hard so week for me. Okay. Literally yesterday. What? Tell me. What is this episode coming out? Tomorrow, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but wait, hold on. I can't share it yet. Okay, so, okay, then don't. But Huge celebrity, though. I'll how, tell you after. Okay, but wait, how did they find you? How did this happen? So they've actually been following Shop Lot Next. A, a good amount of, like, amazing actresses and people that I, I look up to follow the Shop Lot Next account, which is, okay. like, incredible. Um, But... It was through these investors that I that are on my cap table. Um, so I work with a VC called Andreessen Horowitz, mm-hmm. and there is an arm that they have. So mind you, Andreessen is like one of the biggest VCs on the globe, like okay. insane. Like mm-hmm. they have like Airbnb, Uber, like all these huge tech companies. And then there's a vertical called CLF, mm-hmm. and CLF 
they their mission is to have more black latinx and women investors celebrity investors invest in andreessen's portfolio companies and i was a part of andreessen's one of their accelerator programs for like black and brown um entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and so they invested a small check into me and then they loved you know i had an opportunity to meet the team and they were enamored with my story and like all I've done to and similar to you, they're like, wait, what? What were you doing before this? Like, what's your background? And I'm like, so I don't know, I'm just happy yeah. to just make God here, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then they're like, oh my gosh, like, and they literally they they told me to make this Excel doc of celebrities that I would love to have on the cap table. They gave him a whole list. And the guy was like, there is no one. His name is Derek. And just the whole team over there is amazing. Yeah. And he was like, there is no one I cannot talk to. Like, he used mm. to be the manager of, like, huge artists. Right. I said something like, I would love to have Selena Gomez's rare beauty in the marketplace. Or, mm-hmm. like, not not marketplace anywhere. Right. It's our, our retail on our site. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I, he was like, when you do that, he's like, I can make the connection. You just need to come prepared and you need to figure out your business model. And when you have everything figured out, I will make that connection. So it's that. so crazy to be, be so supported in every which way, Yeah, you know, and it was through them where at the top of the year, January 3rd, I had back to back conversations with the managers of the team of some of my favorite Latinas. People that you had on the list. People that I had on the list. (laughs) Yeah. And this past week was a week where I was, again, you know, I'm I'm still moving through what came out during my ceremony a couple weeks back. Mm -hmm. And it's been really hard. And I'm so happy to have a a boyfriend who has been there because I'm just going through it. And I was on the phone with Myra, my my chief of staff, and Mitchell was, was in the room. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, like, yeah, so if you can just, like, add that to Slack. And then I'm like, Wah! oh, my God. And, and they're know- like, what, what? And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like, hold on. Like, stop it right now. And then <clears throat> I got word. They're like, hey, Brittany, I just want to let you know. Like, sorry for the delay. Mm-hmm. She's in. And, you know, we're going to commit this much. Like, hope it helps. We're so excited to be a part of this round. What is that feeling like? Because This know, just happened to me yesterday, so... So what was yesterday like? You And you know you know what's so crazy, Brittany? I was literally about to ask you, when was the last time you felt proud of yourself? And mm. now I'm like, well, that's a moment to be proud of, right? <laughs> like, that's a moment. That's a moment to be proud of. And I actually needed that reminder because... That's so good. I feel like that's so that good. self-worth is and feeling proud of myself is something that I don't do often that I need to do more. Yes. And um, but yesterday I was like a little bit like still under the weather. Yeah, yeah. So I just kind of like slept and um I think today you slept through that excitement. Today we're gonna can we um <laughs> click clack? Yes. Yay! Oh, cheers! Congratulations! <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I um, love this for you. Thank you, and I'm so you know to have her on the team or her as an investor, and then Wanda, who's going to be leading out retail and merchandising. It's I'm like okay, it's all coming to life. You know, the, the feature of Shop Latinx is that we are a curated retailer of the best, you know, so the, the mission is still the same, you know, uh, Latinx made products. Right now, we're actually going to refocus and expand our beauty category. Okay. And so we want to have beauty brands, but also too, like the way that we merchandise it is so important. And, um, I'm really excited to to show the world what amazing Latina owned brands look like, you know, what the experience is like when yeah. they when they feel a product. And then it's on us, Shop Latinx, to tell those stories, you know, and we want to be able to celebrate our community 365. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not relegated to a month. 
Right. We're, we're bigger than that. We're stronger than that. You know? How can we help? Like, because I always, when it comes to community, I'm always like, how can we help? What can we do? So in what ways can we help you in your business? Well, you personally, I mean, you even bringing me on here to share my oh. story is, I'm so grateful. Oh. <laughs> Don't make me cry. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to cry. But... And then in addition, I think. I always tell my audience, you know, like, you it's have really to hard for, you have to I share. guess it's hard to ask for help is what I'm realizing in this moment. You know, and I think really? if, um. I think just spending your money with intention, um, supporting Latino, Latina, Latinx businesses, you know, next time you make that purchase, ask yourself, you know, where is my money actually going? Um, who's it supporting? What values are they supporting? And if you feel that it aligns with the values that we share, you know, you can go on our website, you can go on the respective brands website, you can yes. go on and, you know, just, I think this is, this is the season and year of mindfulness, you know, mm. even if you want to save it, save your money, I think just, you can support me by, I think, supporting yourself <laughs> yes. you know? and i'm always telling my audience like we have to share we have to retweet we have to repost like yeah that those, would mean a lot yeah those things have to happen because it's only through the sharing that we can really uplift one another um oh, Brittany, i love your story so much thank you like i it's a story it's a story what is your biggest I would say bucket list goal for 2023. It sounds like you've already reached it so early on. Gosh. Right? But like, this is not it for you. I can imagine like there's so much more that you would want to do. And what are just, you don't have to say all of it, but what, what are some of the things that you want to do within this year? Ooh. Gosh. I mean, it's so cr even this, yeah, this last two months, like I really moved across the country to for love. For we love. love love over here. We love love. So I got the husband down. I got the Ooh. home. I think you're a me, risk taker. <laughs> I like yeah. just to get up and leave and okay, bye. I'm leaving. I'm gonna follow my my man over here. Okay, bye. I'm leaving you Granted, guys. if you lived in a small business. town somewhere, I probably wouldn't have. But I mean, New York. No, New York is it. Like New York, it's it. You yeah. know, and our our second largest market is out here. Yeah. And, but my bucket list, I think, I think first, firstly, like, I think I need to just focus on like finding my joy. And shifting my perspective of a lot of things, you know, and seeing the beauty in things. So do you not feel like fully happy? I think I'm moving through that right You're now. I think that. right now I'm in a place where I'm shutting um, this this part of me that wants to be liked and wants to be loved and wants to be accepted. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's to my own detriment, to my own happiness. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to get to a place where I feel free of that yeah. feeling. And I want to be present because I have everything that I could want. Yeah. You, ha you and I, have we have everything that we need. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think present, I want to be present. I want to have a conversation with nothing looming over my head, or I want to be able to receive this amazing investment from a celebrity without, you know, not even a phenomenal, impactful person, I you know, must know offline. <laughs> and then, know. Yeah. you know, without thinking, crap, I need to, you know, I need to do more, you know, or I, I want to feel enough. Yeah. In 2023, I want to feel enough. I want to be present. I want to find my joy. That's that's it. I will tell you, Brittany, you are enough. And you make us proud. 
And I really want to like <laughs> thank you for coming on the show because honestly, like I really fell in love with your entire story and just what you have built for yourself. No, I'm crying. <laughs> I knew it was gonna come out. Yeah. Um, but I think your story, just you sharing it, there's a sense of courage, you know, because for you to do everything that you've done, like you really like you fucked with yourself on a different level. Like you really <laughs> bet it on yourself. You know, like there's people that I, I know people in my life right now that tell me, I don't know what my purpose is. And that's really hard, right? When you just don't know why you're even here. Your resilience to keep going, to be that truth seeker in yourself, right? And like even in your business and not give up, even not having the knowledge. If you are not proud in this moment, I am telling you, I am so proud of you because you've done a lot and you are enough. And thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> like, thank you, thank you. I do have, before you even get out of here, I have a couple of just rapid fire questions. Yes. We'll shift the energy real yes. quick. Yes, let's do um, it. Okay. Tell me you're Latina without telling me you're Latina. Oof. Oof. <laughs> I know everybody. Everybody gets stuck on this one. Um, I feel like, ooh, I don't have it on right now, but I'll, I'll, I wear like my gold nameplate necklace and like yes. gold hoops Yep. or I'll, you know, I'll refer to like panties as like chonis or something. Yep. And it. then I love, um, like beans are my go-to beans and eggs, beans and rice. Love that. Okay. Um, what's one thing you need in the morning? coffee what's the last movie that made you cry with laughter everything everywhere all at once mm. have you have you seen it no it's but so i'm good. gonna check it out it's so good okay and finish this sentence growing up latina is it's beautiful mm. Brittany Chavez, everybody. <laughs> Make sure you guys follow her. Shop Latinx. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. You're amazing. Thank you.